Hi, I'm Fred Morazzo, and you're watching Chronica on KMVT. Our show is being taped on Wednesday, December 8th, 2004. And my guest today is Francisco Jimenez. He is an educator and an author. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. It's good, good to have you. Um, we want to talk about, you've written a couple of books. Um, one is called The Circuit. Mm -hmm. The other is a sequel called Breaking Through. And it's really, uh, how would you describe it? Are these a memoir or autobiography? Yes, they're, they're autobiographies. They're based on my uh, growing up in a family of Mexican migrant workers. Um, and I, the first one, Stories from the Life of a Migrant Child, the circuit, Stories from the Life of a Migrant Child, begins with our crossing the border, uh, Mexican border to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was four years old. Uh, coming from uh, rural parts of Mexico, what is called Los Altos de Jalisco. Mm -hmm. and then Jalisco. Jalisco, in okay. the state of Jalisco. Okay. And, and then taking the train, uh, second class train to the border and crossing it illegally. We didn't have any documentation. Right. And then uh, I describe our uh, life as migrant workers moving from place to place following seasonal crops. And that's what the uh, first book deals with. Mm -hmm. I, I take memorable experiences from my childhood, and then I create a story around that memorable experience. For example, the first story is titled Under the Wire, mm -hmm. uh, the, briefly where I describe the, the anxiety and the excitement that I felt crossing the border hoping to leave our poverty behind and starting a new and better life in this country. Right. And then. Uh, the second story is titled uh, Inside Out, where I describe my experiences going to school mm -hmm. for the first time not knowing a word of English mm -hmm. and the frustration I felt trying to understand the teacher and not being able to, to do so. Right. And, um, and my coping with the English language and trying to figure out what was going on in the classroom and so forth. Right. Yeah, that's uh, now. You, we should also say that you're a professor at yes. Santa Clara University. Yes. You're the uh, you teach modern languages. Yes, I'm in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, and I'm also the director of Ethnic Studies. Ethnic Studies. Mm -hmm. And what exactly is yeah. that? How do you how do you describe that? The the program, the Ethnic, ethnic studies, studies program. Yeah. The, the the program is a uh, an academic uh, program that offers courses dealing with uh, ethnic. Um, groups in the United States, principally the historically underrepresented groups, the Asian mm -hmm. American, African American, mm -hmm. um, uh, Latino, Chicano. I see. Uh, and, and those courses deal with the experiences of all those groups in this country and their contributions to our society. I see. Okay, great. So, uh, you and you were talking about uh, what it was, how, how difficult it was to mm -hmm. learn. And I wanted to ask you about that mm -hmm. learning English, because uh, you, you came up here when you were four years old. Right. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, there are some great stories in the book about your trying to get, trying to cope with learning the language. What was what was that like? Um, trying trying to to learn English. Um, well, it, it, <laughs> as you know, English is one of the most <laughs> difficult languages to learn. Um, it's not as difficult as Chinese or mm -hmm. some of the Asian languages, but it is rather difficult to learn. And uh, mm -hmm. since we, we only spoke Spanish at home and we lived in migrant camps where people around us only spoke Spanish, mm -hmm. so the only time I heard English was when I would go to school. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, s so my exposure to the English language was rather limited. Yeah. But eventually I know, through some struggles and, and with the help of many wonderful teachers, I was able to learn English well enough to, in order to succeed in school. Right. And you, and you certainly have. I mean, you've, you've come a long way, I suppose, from, from, those, from those humble days. Well, and that's, uh, I suppose so, but it was not all my doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a lot of help, especially from teachers. Right. That's one of the themes that I notice in, in your book is uh, education was a big was a big theme yes. for you. It was something that was, um, I mean, your parents told you that education was the way to get out of having mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. uh, lead a life that they had to go through uh, working in the fields. Um, you talk about that. What was that like? Be yes. you know, as a child, um, mm -hmm. having to pick co cotton. Mm -hmm. I don't think people really understand what cotton mm -hmm, is when mm -hmm, you pick mm -hmm. how diff how hard that yes, is. Yes, it is very difficult. Well, the, the, uh, like all migrant uh, families, um, children start to 
to work in the fields at a very young age. I started to work alongside my parents when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. And even when we started school, uh, my older brother and I would miss the first two year, uh, the first two months of every year mm -hmm. uh, during the harvest season. Wow. And so, uh, and the reason for that is that it's very important to try to save enough money during the harvest season mm -hmm. so that you can survive the winter months when there is little or no work at all. Mm -hmm. And consequently, uh, ch young children like myself and my older brother, uh, we miss school the first two months of school. And I would start school every year around November, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was uh, you know, still one of my favorite uh, Times months because yeah. I think of Thanksgiving coming mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, and talk about the contratista, contratista and bracheros. Mm -hmm. what, the, what are those terms? Yeah. Yeah, um, as we were, um, we would pick strawberries in Santa Maria, mm -hmm. and then um, then we would move up to the Central Valley around fr the Fresno area, okay. where we would pick uh, grapes for raisins, and then uh, move up to Corcoran, where we would pick cotton. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, the, the contratistas are the middlemen. The, they're the individuals who uh, seek out workers okay. for the ranchers, okay. basically. Like recruiters? Uh, recruiters, <laughs> yeah. And, they, and they're the ones who um, you know, uh, go into the migrant uh, camps and say, there's, I can find work for you for this, this rancher. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, you pay a fee for that. And right. They charge you a certain percentage of what you earn. Oh, I see. And yeah. that's what uh, the contratista does. He's oh. a, co a contractor, contractor, basically. Contractor, yeah. okay. That's mm -hmm. where that comes from. Yeah. And the bracero. And the bracero. Bracero uh, in Spanish uh, or in English means uh, someone who works with uh, his or her hands. Oh, I see. Uh, but, uh, but the... the the w we had the, what was called the Bracero Program mm -hmm. that was uh, started in 1946 that lasted until 1964. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, a program that was um, uh, an agreement between the Mexican government and, and the United States to bring Mexican workers to this country um, for a short period of time to work in the fields or to uh, serve in areas that were uh, scarce during the, uh, or immediately after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they would bring in, legally, they would bring in the braceros to do that work, and then after three or f six months, then they would go back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was what was called the bracero program. Program, okay. So, uh, basically, it was uh, to, um, to fill the need for workers in this country, especially yeah. during right after the World War II, and that was accepted. I mean, that was that that was there was a need for that. Oh, uh, there was a tremendous need because many of these of these soldiers mm -hmm. who went to war uh, left their jobs here, and mm -hmm. so who was going to take care of the, you know, working in the fields, in the railroads, and and so forth. Oh, so that's why the Bracero program became so important here. Right. Oh, I see. Now you were, are you, you have an older brother, Robert, yes. and mm -hmm. you talk mm -hmm. about your older yes. brother. You're the second oldest. I'm the second oldest. I uh -huh. see. Okay. And it seemed that your family grew um, as, as, oh, you, yes. as you went along. Yes. Of, of yes. course. Are you, how, how many brothers and sisters? There are five brothers and two sisters. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's a your, large family. Your mother must have been uh, an angel. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she is. Yes, yes, yes. She's an extraordinary woman uh, because she, she not only worked alongside uh, my father yeah. working in the fields, yeah. but in, after the uh, the day after work, then she would go uh, and do the uh, the cooking yeah. and taking care of the younger kids. So it's double duty. Yeah. So she was really talk uh, about a, a super mom. <laughs> super mom, exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's a true super yeah, mom. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, the, the theme, uh, immigration seems to be a central theme, uh, one of the themes in the book. Mm -hmm. um, La Migra was mm -hmm. somebody who you dreaded, uh, yes. you talked about. Yeah, because we were here uh, without documentation, we were always uh, afraid that we would be caught by the Migra or the immigration officers, immigration. the Border Patrol. Border Patrol. Yeah, and, uh, and so we would hit our... Um, birthplace. I would always say I was born in Colton, California. Mm -hmm.